You're listening to Metal and High Heels, the official podcast from the magazine about metal, lifestyle, and entertainment. Welcome back to our Metal and High Heels podcast. Uh, I'm Steffi, and today I'm here with my lovely co-host Kiki, and we want to talk about the latest Epica album, Omega. Hello, everybody. And um, yes, this is a very anticipated uh, episode for for me and I guess for for Steffi as well, right? We are both um, big Epica fans. Uh, So much (laughs) should be said beforehand. (laughs) And we will talk a little bit about the record. And after that, you will hear my interview with Simon Simmons, lead singer of Epica. And um, that was a lovely talk that we had. And I will tell you more about it after we have spoken about the record that was just released on February 26th. And it's called Omega. Yeah, exactly. And the last album um, is already five years ago. Uh, the holographic principle and yeah they got a quite long um, break between the two records and of course we were very curious how it will be Um, yeah what's the output after that long time and yeah Kiki what do you think are you confident with the music yes (laughs) (laughs) Um, well, before we before we 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 go forward and dive into the topic, um, I want to mention that we did you and I, Steffi, did a whole Epica band special uh, for the podcast, and so I will link in the show notes um, the episode about all of Epica's history, so that everybody uh, who doesn't know them that well can get caught up and know. What we talked about back then, um, we went through the whole through the whole discography and the band history. And on that episode, I said that when they released "Design Your Universe," um, that was a big, big step in in an an incredible direction. It was so. Um, so different to what they had done before and after that well Requiem for the Indifferent was kind of okay-ish but then the Quantum Enigma came out in 2013 and that was another huge step that I really really liked and so I thought that was the best Epica record and three years after that in 2016 the Holographic Principle came out and that blew my mind completely that was then the best thing <laughs> that was their best release <laughs> so far and by with that they set the the bar so high for my expectations of their music and the holographic principle is a very complicated album and it was also a lot of material that the band had gathered together um to produce the the release and so um the book, The Essence of Epica, that came out in 2019, for which they took a break, because um, after releasing The Holographic Principle in 2016, they went to tour out to tour the world in promotion of the record. And after they had done that in 2018, they took a break from touring and, um, and wrote The Essence of Epica, their autobiographic uh, book. And so I got that one as well. And um, I was just reading the other day that for the holographic principle, they had about 25 songs that they had worked on. And from that, they went into pre-production with uh, Jos van den Broek and they cut, cut that down up to 20 songs that they then really worked on. And from those 20 or 18 songs or something like that, they released 12 in the holographic principle and then five or six in the solar system that was an EP they released after. And they released this EP and 
that's some that's another thing that we have said in this in this podcast before <laughs> for those of you who are listening for the first time we advise or it's our opinion <laughs> that EPs are great when you are an up and coming new band that doesn't have enough material to release a record but when you are an established band that has enough material to relate to release full length records it's kind of weird to have EPs in between Um, Delane, for example, is a band that used to do that a lot, and I didn't like that. But and and I also didn't. I I wasn't thrilled to see uh, the solar system come after the holographic principle, because I think those that material could have um, been worked for a full length album that might have come shortly after. Right? Because we I was also used to Epica releasing records every three years, more or less. And that was very fast. But if we then know that they had 25, um, album, 25 songs to start, then we know that they compose a lot, even though they are on tour almost the whole time. So with this knowledge in, in the back of our heads, so to speak, um, after the release of the book in 2019, we were already anticipating a uh, a new record, right? And it ha had already been three years since the holographic principle. And so they announced that in 2020, they would release their eighth uh, studio album. And that, of course, had to be postponed um, due to the pandemic. And um, we talked about that with Simon in the interview. So you will get a lot of more insight into that part. But it had been in total five years after the last full length album. And so my expectations were really, really high. Uh, during that time, and mostly during the pandemic, I didn't listen to Epica a lot. Um, and so I was waiting, I was expecting something new that would hit me like a train and I would be blown away. And Omega sadly didn't do that. Oh, Yeah, I don't want to say that I'm disappointed because they are my favorite band. But, um, I don't know. It's, the album in general is very epica, um, but it's not that, there's nothing super innovative. And now listening and watching some of their newer or, or most recent interviews, um, Simone and Mark have said that The holographic principle was very overloaded, that there were so many things that they wanted to do, and they didn't want to do that again. And so for Omega, they, they, they wanted something like calmer and more, I don't know, more, more grounded, maybe? And I think that if that was their goal, they totally nailed it because omega is very is very calm and cohesive and um and that is actually uh yeah a positive thing what are your thoughts jeffy on the album as a whole Whew. um yeah first of all it's definitely typical epica um my i don't want to call it problem but um because of their very own style it feels more like um, yeah it's again a new epica song and it's hard for me to find something new in it it's hard to explain because there are definitely always some new elements um uh in this album for example they recorded with an um children's crier what they never did before um so that's definitely a new element and um yeah with the huge um orchestras or um the separated um instruments which are not <laughs> typical metal stuff like like a yeah flute or a different kind of drums whatever um the all these stuff is definitely always something um new but it doesn't feel so innovative for me anymore mm -hmm. because it's just like always there 
and that doesn't mean that it's uh, bad music or something never never ever yeah but if i could have a wish <laughs> i would wish something um i don't know that they would like to experiment more with spectral <laughs> for example <laughs> just something sounds okay interesting yeah yeah why not <laughs> just to get a little bit like yeah a little bit more or different salt in the soup um yeah i think that's yes might be i point. know i know what you mean and i i agree uh maybe not on the electronic part <laughs> but <laughs> you don't have to to invent the wheel again uh, is that only a german saying i don't know um but it doesn't mean that you that that every time you put something out there it has to be something completely different and unique and no that nobody ever has heard before not at all yeah it's just uh what they've been doing so far and that also again doesn't have to be a bad thing um omega is the culmination of the trilogy the metaphysical trilogy as epica calls it that began with the quantum enigma um then the holographic principle, and now Omega. And so it didn't have to be something completely new. And for the future, I am really hoping <laughs> that they will, uh, will start something, something a little bit different, at least. And um, there's also another, another trilogy that's been completed here, the trilogy of Kingdom of Heaven. That one began in Design Your Universe, and that is something that is very, um, very much Mark, Mark's thing. Um, apparently, he's the fan of trilogies, and uh, well, Epica has has always had these kind of um, songs that that interconnect with one another, and so Kingdom of Heaven Part One was in design your universe that's the one that was in design your universe and then part two was in the quantum enigma and part three is here and is here in omega and so um it's all as as the title says as the album title says itself right it's all coming back together and and fulfilling a circle so from that from that perspective it's all right that they didn't do something completely new and different but i i i am as I am, as you said, Steffi. I, I need a little bit more of spice of something new and different. But you already <laughs> mentioned something that is actually new that they haven't done before. And it's the collaboration with a children's choir. Um, and so that's my direct question. Did you like that part? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because... Um... I have pros and cons in my mind. Um, on the one hand, it's definitely um, it makes sense that they work with that kind of choir, so to speak. Um, and if I didn't watch the making of videos before, <laughs> to be honest, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have noticed that it's new that they never worked with a uh, children's choir before because it okay. felt very natural to the sound and it just it just fits um on the other hand i am <laughs> just not sure if i like children's choir itself because <laughs> uh they are always a little bit creepy but yes. also mm, <laughs> pathetic Creepy and pathetic, so to speak, uh, sounds quite negative. <laughs> of course, it can also be very beautiful. Depends how it's um, how it's used, how it's uh, mixed with the other music and sound. Um, yeah, I think um, in rivers, in that song, in the ballad, I think there it um, fits probably best. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't describe why. <laughs> why that's my opinion. Um, but there it just fits to the atmosphere, and it's not too dominant. But um, yes, very 
um, how to how to say it's it's good point <laughs> yeah. that fits. I think it fits, it fits very well. Um, and other songs, there was that kind of creep <laughs> factor. Yes, uh, I think a children's choir, for example, works wonders when you're working on a horror movie soundtrack. And, um, <laughs> and yes, I, I, I agree that it's, uh, it can have a very eerie sound and add a bit of um, gloominess um, and darkness. Yeah, uh, this, this horror aspect that I at least combine or, or associate a lot with children's squires. Um, so I actually didn't really like it. I didn't like that addition to the to the sound. Uh, I agree, though, that rivers in rivers, that actually sounds quite nice. Um, but for example, on the code of life, it's it's something that I would erase completely of the of the song. <laughs> That's actually one of my favorite songs of the album. But uh, this the children's choir singing Vida is like, ugh, no, why? No, no, no. Anyway. Um, yeah, should we <laughs> should we go through the through the songs a little bit uh, really quickly? Um, we start yeah. with the intro and that one is well, it's an intro, right? Exactly. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> like they did before. Yeah. Exactly. They they've always yeah, had this powerful like a intro. Uh, exactly, cinematic sounding uh introduction to the to the songs. Oh, I don't remember talking about children's choir. Um I don't remember which song it was exactly. It might be the skeleton key. But the children's choir there adds this nightwish kind of sound. There was at least there was one song on the album that that's that was that reminded me of I think it's the poet and the pendulum from Nightwish where the the children's voices sound like yeah at this eerie aspect but I might be also completely wrong um anyway yes the intro is very on style it's it's a good welcome to the album prepares you to what you are about to hear and to listen to and of course um threads right into a, abyss of time uh, with the with the melodic mo motifs and themes, and so that's actually just very fitting. And Abyss of Time is a great single. It's one of the best songs in the album. It's very powerful, and that one I actually really liked. Mm. Yeah, I think it's um, also the um, main song. Not because of uh, length. There are some songs which are. Yeah, three th three songs, <laughs> which are uh, have a longer duration. Um, but yeah, because of the sound and that yeah heaviness, for me, Abyss of Time, and of course because it's the first single, um, it's one of the main songs of Omega. Yes, the fact that uh, it was released so early. Uh, or so much in advance, so far in advance to the release of the album kind of put me off of it a little bit. Like I knew it so well already that listening to it, listening to it on the album was, was, yeah, again, it had this, this feeling of, yeah, this is a good song, but <laughs> it's been there forever. <laughs> yeah, you just know it. Huh. Yes. And then we go to, the Skeleton Key, which is actually my favorite of this album. Yes! <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> I love uh, that Simone has been, has been experimenting with these new um, kind of new vocals. Styles is not really the, the, the appropriate word, but just doing new things with her voice, right? So her vocals are very rhythmic. And then there are these lovely, fully operatic lines as well. The heavy riffs are, are, are really great in that one. And we just saw with the release of the album also the video for that song, which is amazing. And um, 
And that one we will watch or we will have watched on our Heavy Friday Metal Talks on, on my Twitch channel, which we do um, almost every Friday now. And I will link to that in the show notes as well. So we will have talked about this song already <laughs> when you tune in. But um, yes, everybody's welcome to tune in and talk to us, talk with us about uh, new videos and songs that um, that we watch there together with Pia and Steffi and uh, a lot of very lovely people that uh, talk to us and watch us there. Um, yeah, anything else that you like, especially about the Skeleton Key, Steffi? Um, not really. I think you just uh, nailed it with the, uh, with the description. Um, it's definitely the singing style of Simona, which um, I noticed in a very positive way. Um, and yeah, that's that little new <laughs> spark, mm -hmm. um, new element. Uh, what I, um, or I think that's why I, um, that's also my favorite song because it's doesn't felt like, yeah, yeah, I know it already, <laughs> or it felt just a little bit too familiar. Yeah, and there was something so, huh. Oh, ah, that's new. Ah, cool. And yeah, um, yeah because of that, it's um, yeah, pretty good. And it still, and it still yeah. also has this very catchy chorus, which you can sing along. So, um, mm. all, all in all, the skeleton keys is my favorite on this album. And then we go over to Seal of Solomon, the fourth, um, the fourth song on this on this release which could easily be in the Quantum Enigma. It's really nothing new. I don't know. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good. And I think I also want to mention that um, maybe it sounds like we uh, don't like the album or something, but not not only, but just of course, <laughs> just because um, the whole production quality epica always do um mm -hmm. it's such a fucking amazing band and if you watch the making of videos and um see how they work together in studio with so many different instruments and doing some acoustic uh stuff also acoustic versions i always feel so wow that's such an amazing band and such amazing musicians working together um yeah i just want to say that <laughs> clear <laughs> mm -hmm. that they are very talented guys and um yeah i wish just something a little bit new elements <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the quality of production is just perfect yes and that's a good that's it that's good that you say something positive before I say something very negative, because oh. uh, number number five number five on this record is for the first time in ten years a song that I don't like at all an epica song that I don't like. Last time it was I don't even remember the song, but it was from Requiem for the Indifferent back in twenty eleven, and Gaia, I, I I don't like it. I don't <laughs> like it at all. I don't even know what exactly I uh, no, I just I just don't like it at all. Okay. Do you like Gaia? I I can't tell you. It's like um, yeah, just the point once again. Uh, all the songs I would say are good, typical Epica songs, but just it's like the same. It's like one big same stuff. And Gaia is one part of that one big stuff. Mm -hmm. But then we do go over to Code of Life, and that one I do like a lot. I love the music. Um, I there's what I already mentioned: the children's choir singing Vida at, at the beginning of the chorus mm -hmm. that really puts me off. But otherwise, it's actually a pretty good song. Uh, the lyrics I think are about um, genetic editing. So there's this. Um, I saw a comment on Facebook uh, today um, saying that there's this science versus God theme, you know, like God created is created this planet 
the, the, the lyrics, disclaimer, the lyrics never mention God, but there is this sense of like, why do we have to mess with nature, right? Why are we playing, playing God almost? As, and as I said, the lyrics never mention God, but there is, there is this kind of like aftertaste of science is evil versus, you mm. know, don't mess with nature kind mm. of. Um, so that is the only thing that, that yeah, it le leaves that. So and, do you and like the, what? So do you like the song and or the lyrics, or that's a negative point for you? That um, theme? Those are those are a bit of of, of uh, negative negative aspects of the song, but in general, I love the music in this song, and I love the the vocals as well. So, um, "Code of Life" is actually one one of the songs that I've been that I've been singing that have stuck with me after listening to the album. Yes, and then we go over to another one that we've been uh, that we've known for a few weeks, months, months. It feels like months. Well, everything in the pandemic feels like eternity, but still, um, "Freedom: The Wolves Within" Ooh. is another super catchy, heavy, um, great single. Again, another strong and great single. Um, do you have anything to add? No, and uh, yeah, I think we all spoke before about the song and especially about the video, um, the animation video. Um, yeah, it's one of the heavier ones, um, which wants to go forward and yeah, metalish. <laughs> yes, and then number eight. This is this is this must be intentional. N song number eight on the album number eight is Kingdom of Heaven Part Three, the Antediluvian Universe, which completes the trilogy of Mark's Kingdom of Heaven um, theme. And so this is one of Mark's things. Um, it's his lyrics. It's the the themes or the topics he's been talking about for years in his. In, in Epica's albums and music. So this one is actually a really cool one. It's 13 minutes long. And I actually took the time to listen to all of the Kingdom of Heavens, one after the other. And they actually fit really well. Uh, I would like to see that live. It's, of course, 30 minutes of music, you know, 30 minutes of, of stage time that they probably won't use to play three songs. Uh. But... Um, wow. It's cool to 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 have that bit of of information and and maybe uh, listen to the to those three songs and pay attention to the lyrics. It's really interesting to see the evolution of the same topic throughout throughout over ten years that Mark has been writing about about this. Um, and Simone tells us a little bit about what that topic is for Mark and for the band in the interview that we will listen to in a little bit. And then we, go, we get to Rivers. And Rivers was one of the, uh, of the songs and videos that we watched lately in the chats that we have on Twitch. And I remember that I said, um, the video is amazing, really nice looking and everything. And the the song is probably more emotional when I listen to it alone and, more importantly, when I listen to it in the context of the whole album. Because as a single, eh. And that's, that turned out to be true. When I listened to Rivers in the context of listening to the whole album, it was way more emotional and way nicer to listen to than as a single. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's almost it for me. After that, there is nothing very worth of comment. <laughs> oh, wow. It's good, but it's nothing new. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Um, because for me, yeah, first, uh, Rivers, um, I like that song a lot um, because it's very, um, has that calm touch and it's, I read in 
some interviews or uh, listened to some interviews and podcasts that people called it very sad and that surprised me a little bit because it's um definitely very calm but for me it's it feels more like relaxing and um has this um yeah ups and downs in the music i think um Simone or uh, Rob Pandalo wrote the song mm -hmm. and one of them explained that um yeah the the music should just um show the waves on the river mm -hmm. and that's um they did that very well i would say and yeah that has that very relaxing feeling like yeah if you're listening to to the sea or just water sounds <laughs> they um got it they catch that mm -hmm. very good um yeah to really <laughs> that is and, true yeah. yeah the next uh, three songs or the last um for me it felt somehow like a part like the last part of the album mm -hmm. um I'm not ah uh, still not hundred percent into it, but somehow after the third listening probably, um that felt like okay, that's for me the more interesting part of it. Oh really? Omega has a very Omega has a very um good refrain. Is it? But no probably mm -hmm. well, no, I can't can't talk anymore. <laughs> um Yes, and yeah, once again, typical Epica, not that new, but uh, yeah, it, it got me. Yeah, I would say that Twilight Reverie is for me actually one of the the highlights um, towards the end of the album. It's uh, mm -hmm. also kind of catchy, and um, it was even in in the first or second listen something that I thought, oh, that's interesting, but. Again, it was, it's still very, <laughs> it's very epic. It's very Mark. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, all in all, also lyric wise, it's the same topics that we're used to from Epica. These very um, encouraging lyrics or encor encouraging themes of living without fear and taking leaps of faith and, you know, trying to, um, all of these kind of spiritual or, or metaphysical, well, it's, it's in the, the title, right, of the metaphysical th uh, trilogy, uh, themes of, you know, the universe and the cosmos and the energy and whatever. So that is, that is something that we're used to. And also the difference between Marx and Simone's uh, lyric writing is very noticeable. Mark always goes for more complex, for, yeah, more complex words and terms and concepts. And Simone is more down to earth. Even when, when, she, when she writes about more complex uh, subjects, like, uh, again, the genetic editing, right? So um, when I, I notice a difference there for sure. And uh, again, that's nothing bad. It's just, um, the difference in their styles and something that has been happening throughout their music in their whole history. And um, that's only something, something that, that I, that I noticed. And um, yeah, it's a, it's actually a good album. It's good music. Definitely. They are obviously all very, yeah, it's Epica. They are, they are with good reason. Uh, uh, such an established and important band in the in the symphonic metal scene, and they have made a name of themselves by creating great music throughout decades. And this 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 is not a not a bad album at all. It's actually a really good album. It's a really good music. The videos they've released along with it is also really good. I look forward to getting to getting my copy. Um, I haven't gotten it yet. I was just uh, telling Sheffi before we hit the recording button that in pre-pandemic times, um, I would rush to the record store the day the 
the album dropped and get it physically in my hands. And for the last two records, for the Quantum Enigma and the Holographic Principle, I got um, the big earbook, I think is what they call it, uh, like this um, vinyl-sized book with art and, and with the art and the lyrics and um, at least three CDs. Usually it was the original album, uh, the bonus tracks with acoustics uh, and the instrumentals, the instrumental version of the album. And I think uh, this one might even have a fourth CD, but I'm not sure about that. Anyway, that's the one I'm getting for sure. And it's also nice to see who has worked with them before. Um, Marcela did some backing vocals for the Holographic Principle. And she also posted on social media that she did, again, backing vocals uh, for Omega. So um, that's something, for example, that I didn't hear. I didn't hear her voice. Her voice is so distinct and unique. I usually always hear it. And in this mix, I didn't. But anyway, that's something that I'm, that I'm really looking forward to, to have it in my hands. So I'm for sure going to buy it. Um, but yes. Um, it's sadly not not an album like the ones before that I want to listen to only that album for months. And as I said, it, in 10 years, it has happened again that there is one song that I don't like at all. So yeah, <laughs> as everything, right? It has... Um, uh, positives and negatives, uh, but all in all, I actually think Omega is is a solid album. Definitely, yes. Um, and I think about if maybe they just um, grow a little bit too big, because if I look at all the um, guys, people who were involved into this production. These are many, many, many people. <laughs> um, um, yeah, maybe I think Epica wants always um, become bigger and bigger and bigger and make the sound bigger again. <laughs> More epic. Um, maybe they should and and they do it very, very well. In my ears, almost perfect. Or for me, it's the best um, metal band who can combine symphonic elements with metal music. Mm -hmm. I think they do it in the best way because it's still heavy. Um, but I wonder if they maybe should just go a little bit down again, a little bit to the roots um oh well maybe the roots are still symphonic um do you know what i mean the production got just always bigger with every album you thought i think you mentioned in already in the beginning with um quantum enigma you're listening to it and think wow fuck that's that's perfect the best i ever listened to that's how music should be or <laughs> how i love it mm -hmm. and they still want to keep it up and up and up and make it more or just keep it keep it in that high level on that high level and i wonder if um with this album it's maybe enough and now they can just a little bit lay back <laughs> and say okay just stay uh, or just next album with two violins and that's it <laughs> just um, an idea popped up in my mind um, I don't agree with that. I oh, finally something we don't agree on. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, um, I think I expected it to be bigger, and I think they always have aimed towards big, huge productions, which is great. It's always great to have uh, big goals and big dreams, and um, that is, I think, the difference between the holographic principle and Omega. The holographic principle was this big huge production with everything they could show and everything they could put into the mix and i think it was on purpose that they um backed away from that a little bit for omega and and produced or created this more 
grounded and cohesive, calmer sounding um, album. Um, I don't know about the whole Back to the Roots thing in general, because uh, I do think that bands uh, should always be evolving and growing with their music and innovating. Um, so that's actually maybe what what puts me off a little bit of the album, that uh, there is not that much visible growth in this album, and which is why I am such a fan of the, the Skeleton Key. The Skeleton Key, as we just discussed, is just this heavier and, and, and vocally also a little bit different song that, that packs so much more punch than the rest. Um, but yeah, that was, that was it from, from us for now. Um, you will listen to my conversation with uh, Simon Simmons about Omega and about how the whole uh, production process um, was limited by the pandemic, the last stages of, of it at least, and um, what, they, what they have been doing all these five years, kind of, and also what might be in there for the future. So it was a very, very cool talk that I had with Simone. Um, it was very last minute that we got that interview with her. And um, I wanted to ask her as many questions as possible. And of course, they, all the members in Epica have been so busy promoting the album because also, since they cannot tour right now, uh, digital promotion and interviews and streams and uh, or live streams, well, like Instagram lives and stuff like that, they haven't. They are one of the few bands that haven't had a um, uh, that haven't performed on a live stream. Um, and I also asked her about that. Um, yeah, so so they were so busy that I that I felt kind of guilty <laughs> of having to. <laughs> to uh, of having her time, and so I think I was kind of kind of rushing through all of the questions that I wanted to ask and didn't get to un to ask all of them. So I apologize for that in advance if <laughs> if my conversation seems a little a little rushed, but it was really nice to hear what she has to say about everything that I um, about all of the curious questions that I had about uh, Omega and about the state of the band right now. So um, have fun with that. Thank you so much for listening to the 86th episode of the Metal and High Heels podcast. And as always, you can um, find everything we've talked about here in the show notes, which you can find on metal and highheelscom slash podcast 86. And yeah, Steffi, where can people find us? On social media mostly um facebook and instagram and um yeah twitter also yeah and yeah you can stream podcast um yeah on your preference podcatcher on spotify yes subscribe obviously wherever you're listening to, to us right now and as i said um you are very welcome everybody to reach out to us on social media and also on our uh, heavy Friday metal talks on Twitch. The link will be also in the show notes. And yes, as always, many thanks to Cassandra Novell and Mercy Isle for our jingle. And yeah, we'll see you next time. And have fun with Simona right now. <laughs> Hi. I'm here with Simon Simmons from Epica tonight. How are you doing tonight? Hello, thanks for having me. I'm I'm great. I'm excited for the uh, upcoming album release. Yes, it's only a few more hours until it's out. Yes. And um, last time you and I spoke was right before the release of the Quantum Enigma in 2014, and it's been a while. <laughs> we talked about uh, back then. We talked about your pregnancy and your wedding, and also about food. So to start with a little bit of a lighter topic, um, in times of the well, maybe this is not that light of a topic, but in in these times of uh, staying at home and the global pandemic and everything, do you still cook a lot of, at home? 
Well, you're asking me that now, right after I made a pizza just in, <laughs> in, in the oven, a deep frozen pizza. But I, I cook like five times a week still. But uh, mm -hmm. sometimes for breakfast, pancakes, and then l lunch I cook, and then dinner as well. So uh, I think it's okay now. Today's been a hectic day, then I'll just throw in some pizzas. My son and my husband love pizza, so they're happy. That's nice. Is that, I think you've always been very adamant about taking care of your health through uh, food, right? Is How do you do that nowadays? How do you take care of your health, both physically and mentally? Uh, well, food-wise, <laughs> I guess it's easier to just snack all day when you're at home than when you're working and you're out and about, you move more. Mm -hmm. So I do try to go out for walks, that I have some sort of exercise because the gyms are closed and besides yoga, Once a week, I don't do a lot of sports at the moment. But today I started mm -hmm. again by doing home workouts. I hate it, but it's yeah, it's necessary because yeah, the mus muscles in the body are starting to how do you say deteriorate? Are they um, yeah become weaker? And I gotta I do it for my like you said for my body, but also for my mind because working out is yeah that. The endorphins are set free and you feel you just feel mm -hmm. great mentally as well yeah it gives you energy and motivation too for the mind as well mm -hmm. exactly so that's really good to hear um well as i was saying it's been a while since we had talked but in the meantime uh, we've spoken to mark and to isaac and we've seen you live many times and of course have uh, kept track of your releases but it's been five years as well since your last full-length record came out can we quickly go over that um that was in 2016 then came the solar system then you took a break mm -hmm. And also released uh, the essence of Epica, the book in 2019. So after the the, tell me about this sabbatical because after that you came with full force again with a new book, with the gold edition of Design Your Universe uh, and the tour for its 10th anniversary. Yeah, after we were done with the tour cycle for the holographic holographic principle, we then um, had our first official sabbatical, but just from the touring because we were working on our biography. We released the solar system EP. We um, worked on the attack on Titan EP and also remixed mm -hmm. design universe and recorded some acoustic tracks. So we were definitely, you know, not just taking time off. There was still a lot going on behind the scenes, but being mm -hmm. home more and not, Traveling for a while was was nice. So after the sabbatical, we were yeah we felt revived again and started working on the songs and yeah and then we recorded the album and then almost at the end of the recording the pandemic hit and we were forced mm -hmm. to take a second tour sab sabbatical even though you know we it was not voluntarily we were actually really looking forward to go back on stage and uh, yeah, present yeah. the new songs live. But then things changed all around the world. Yes, that's true. And talking about um, the work for Omega, how was the schedule planned with composing, recording, promotion and touring before the pandemic hit? Can we go into a little bit of more detail there? Well, we started working intensively on the album in... November 2019 and mm -hmm. that's also when we met up together and rented a house in the Netherlands to work on the songs uh, together as a band and um, we live in four different countries so in the past in between all of our touring we were mainly writing a lot of this material at home from our home studios and sending each other ideas back and forth through the internet and then going into the studio mm -hmm. for the last phase of the demo before actually recording it. And now we got together at a very early stage to work on the songs, work on the vocal lines. And it was lovely. You know, we consciously kept our calendars clean, clear of mm -hmm. any other 
obligation. So we didn't have any shows. Um, so we were fully concentrated on writing the new material. And when we were writing the holographic principle, that was partially during our tour from the Quantum Enigma. So that just shows how oh yeah yeah how full our schedule was. And um, that was then in end of November. We were a week together. Then Mark. Um, Joost, myself, and Sasha met up again at the Sand Lane uh, recording facilities mm-hmm. uh, studio to finish writing the vocal lines. And then we went mm-hmm. to America um, to do a couple of shows for Design Universe anniversary uh, edition. And after we came back, that's when we started to record the drums. And mm-hmm. everything was almost done until end of february and then middle of march the lead vocals were supposed to be recorded and that's when the pandemic hit and mark Mm -hmm. stayed in sicily to record his vocals there and i lived in germany and i stayed uh, also at home and went and and searched for a studio nearby and that's how we did it so we were lucky in an unlucky situation because if the pandemic hit sooner then we were not able to record the orchestra the the choirs as well and that's something it's hard to imagine nowadays one year later (laughs) almost true it's been a year since that Mm -hmm. um since all of that started so uh yeah looking back it's it's pretty surreal to see how how everything has changed Mm, yes it is um, talking about the songwriting now, in 2017, when uh, we talked to Isaac, um, he told us that uh, the band had around nine songs that weren't used on the holographic principle nor on the solar system, and that they were just sitting there on shelves wa- waiting to be reworked. Were any of those uh, used for Omega? Not that I recall. Um... I don't don't actually know. Um, I think Mark recently said in an interview, or not in the interview, we released a lot of studio vlogs. And in the latest mm-hmm. vlog, he said that in one song, you hear a guitar riff that he's been working on for 17 years. <laughs> or that wow. he had the idea back back in the day. So it might be that some of, some of the guys, their songs or inspiration or little parts were taken. From those mm-hmm. songs, but I don't recall any clear examples, to be honest. All right. But some of the songs are kind of interconnected, maybe if even if they are fresh and brand new, they are inter- interconnections there, right? So you had, for example, uh, the Embrace That's Mothers in your first albums, and then um, A New Age Dawns was also uh, a theme that started in Consigned to Oblivion and continued in Design Your Universe. And in Design Your Universe, uh, the part five became Kingdom of Heaven, part one, which then uh, continued in the Quantum Enigma, and part three is now in Omega. Um, What is the overarching story that is told there? Well, the story in a nutshell... Uh, is that science and spirituality have to come together to find out the true meaning of life. So that's the gist of the trilogy. And um, Mark is the writer of the lyrics and also the uh, the mind behind the trilogy and the story. Mm-hmm. So he can dive into it deeper. Um, there are, of course, a lot of hidden messages um, he's talking about the uh, as above, so below, that everything exists on a large scale in the universe also exists in the same way in the smallest microscopic scale. So as above, so below, that's mm-hmm. that's a recurring topic. The same with the um, light and dark that we have within ourselves, the our inner yin yang, our the labyrinth that we have within ourselves that we try to navigate through. And um yeah, it's there's there's a lot of messages hidden in it, but the first one was the discussion about near death experience that it is actually you know true many people say they experienced mm-hmm. it yeah wow. and um when we were writing that song, his grandmother passed away, and she played a very big role in epica's 
yeah how do you say epica's um fruit uh, how do you say um ex existence or the origin mm -hmm. of epica so to say she she lended us her basement that's where we were we were rehearsing and you know it's this little she's she was very tiny very skinny and she was sitting on on the couch and we were playing like brutal metal in the basement and she didn't mind she liked it so <laughs> and um so mark dedicated the first kingdom of heaven to his grandmother and now with the mm -hmm. third kingdom of heaven um both mark mark's other grandmother and isaac's grandmother passed away uh, within one week so they oh, dedicated wow. that the third and final kingdom of heaven to both of their uh, grandmothers because it is you know a little bit uh, the story of you know nothing is basically ever gone and yeah. um yeah i think it's a very nice symbolical way to dedicate this to some very important people in in our lives you know that played an important role for sure and it's also a nice way to um wrap up and loop again back to the beginning mm -hmm. right it is again like this alpha and omega thing that you have uh going on right now um and before we go forward uh the the third part of the kingdom of heaven is also subtitled the antediluvian universe is that going to be a next trilogy of interconnecting songs can you see that coming well i i always say expect the unexpected with mark it's his title his idea so i wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if he already thought a little bit of a certain continuation of it or a new a new beginning so mm -hmm. you never know omega is stands for basically the end but not the end of epica you know it might be a new beginning of something so i'm sure he will think of something <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah For the past uh, several records, you have been releasing acoustic versions of the song and of different songs, and this has been getting more and more playful, and you have been giving them their own life and their own names as well. Um, would you ever consider doing a completely acoustic album or maybe tour? I would like to do that. I mean, um, I enjoy doing those acoustic songs. Um, it's a lot of fun, like you say, it's very playful, and we just take all the instruments that we have to our uh, disposal in the room and uh, mm -hmm. record, use them to make a recording. Uh, by now, we have quite a large selection of songs, so who knows? I mean, it, it would be a great way uh, to start touring again if we can for smaller groups of people. <laughs> We'll have to yeah. we'll have to wait and see, but I know that the rest of the guys, maybe with the exception of our drummer, he finds it a little bit boring. I mean, he doesn't have a lot to do. Uh, the other <laughs> guys uh, actually enjoy it as well. I can imagine. And uh, now that we get uh, the honor as well to talk to you, uh, we can dive a little bit more in detail into your vocals as well. Um, after conquering the operatic vocals and the more poppy belting as well you have been experimenting with new vocal techniques in omega you i hear that you're using your voice for more rhythmic parts like in the skeleton key and gaia for example and in general i think you're finding you've been finding new ways to make the lyrics fit the melodies and stuff like that can you tell us a bit more about your creative process Oh, well, for this album, we spend more time and also sooner in the writing process on uh, writing vocal lines. Um, mm -hmm. With each album that we create, we also like to kind of analyze what we can do better, how can we improve ourselves. And the thing with the holographic principle was that everything was so full by the time I had to start writing vocal lines, which made it more difficult. And Epica's mm -hmm. music exists out of many different layers. And yeah, vocals are also extremely important. And that's something we learned after that. So we decided to uh, start working on vocal lines much sooner. And sometimes the guys okay. that write their songs have already a clear idea of how they want the vocals to sound. So they also record a melody with the flute mostly. Uh, of a vocal line they have in mind 
Uh, but I always mm -hmm. ask them to send me the song without their ideas as well, so I can first see what comes up when I'm thinking of vocal lines. Because once I've yeah. heard that melody, it's there. I cannot let it go anymore. Mm -hmm. I cannot unhear it, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so at home, when I was listening to the first demos, I was in the morning, you know, getting ready, sitting at my uh, makeup uh, makeup table, doing makeup and listening to the songs and just singing along a little bit. And if I had an idea that I thought that's cool, then I just grabbed my phone and quickly recorded it on my phone before the idea is gone. Mm -hmm. Because I I do yeah. like to start writing or I like to write music when or vocal lines in this case, kind of subconsciously when I'm not fully concentrated on it. You know, when, that's when you sometimes get the best ideas. Then when you force mm -hmm. it, when I sit down in my recording studio, uh, I don't always feel inspired, and that can be frustrating. And if I just on very um, yeah um how do you say our printer in the background is going crazy if i um do it like sp sporadically during the day then i can sometimes get the best ideas and it's also true what they say before you fall asleep you suddenly get these genius <laughs> genius melodies coming to you and uh, that's why my phone is always within reach if i have an idea i can quickly record it with my phone so then later on when i'm in my recording studio uh, I can then start working on that line and um, write already some lyrics for it. And technique-wise, with each album, I also try to improve wherever I can. And for me, the recording of the EP from Attack on Titan played a big part in my development as a singer, I guess, because mm -hmm. that was also uh, very different to what we normally do with Epica. It was very fast. Yeah. It was a little bit like. Uh, it had a little bit of musical touch to it as well. And I've sung in musicals before, but never had like a huge role. So uh, I enjoyed that very much. And I tried to get a little bit of that onto the, the album. And whatever the songs need, I tried to give it to them. And the, the vocals and lyrics were finished when, you know, uh, the pandemic hit. But the situation mm -hmm. itself made me more emotional in a way which was yeah um a good <laughs> a good outcome for the songs because I, I poured even more uh of my heart into the songs than ever before yeah i think that's something that um is really noticeable actually from the from the record did you uh, or do you work with a vocal coach as well or take lessons from time to time? Maybe? No, I don't. Not at the moment. No. <laughs> All right. We also see a lot of uh, female vocalists uh, starting to learn distorted vocals like growls and screams and do that um, or integrate that, that kind of uh, techniques in addition to their clean vocals. Would that, something, uh, would that be something you'd like to try maybe with the right technique so that you don't... Um, hurt yourself <laughs> well we have mark in the band and he's really good at doing that uh so i don't want to be uh, uh any competition for him but i don't have any ambition <laughs> to do that now all right yeah and there's also no need you you are completely right have you ever thought about uh, doing vocal coaching yourself i've done it in the past but uh, my husband is also a music teacher and he's really good at it but I'm mm -hmm. not a natural born teacher. <laughs> okay. So uh, no, I um, don't really, I don't have the, how do you say, the official education for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it is, it is kind of a, in a way it's very scientific, of course, because uh, it's a lot of the, has to do with the anatomy of your, of your throat. Uh, your vocal cords, your you know your whole face, your your jaws and um, your breathing. But uh, first of all, I don't play the piano that well to uh, mm -hmm. accompany the the singers. I've done it in in the past, but that's really a long time ago. And um, 
I don't get a lot of fun out of doing it. So I see. Yeah, I understand. Um, going to another, uh, to a different aspect of the whole life <laughs> and band life. Um, the pandemic, of course, disrupted all of our lives. Um, but as a band that lives off their touring mostly, did that affect you financially uh, in a bad way as well? Well, no shows mean no money, but there's still many other ways uh, where we can generate money. Of course, merchandise sales, and we do have a new record coming up, and the pre-sales are looking good. And besides that, Epic have worked their ass off for the last almost 20 years. So we do have some reserve, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. we had one of the biggest European tours planned with Apocalyptica and Wheel. And had to reschedule mm -hmm. that two times. Uh, it's more the yeah. emotional damage that you get from releasing an album and not being able to tour. That's the first time for us in our lives. Many of our colleagues already experienced it. I saw it happening and I felt really uh, sorry for them. And now I'm going through the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the release was rescheduled once already, right? It was supposed yes. to mm -hmm. come out in October, if I'm correct. Uh, in September, and the tour was in October originally, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, can we talk a little bit more about that? There's a, long, a lot of musicians doing stuff like Patreon, or um, a lot of them also have still have uh, their day jobs and stuff. Uh, do you? Does any one of you uh, still have other uh, sources of income on which to rely on in times like these? Well, Epica is our main job, so to say, mm -hmm. but Rob, is, uh, he's a teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, I still have my little photography company, although that is also kind of non-active because of the pandemic as well. Yeah. It's, it's difficult to uh, shoot, <laughs> to take photos of, of people and families and uh, get by, and um, I was I was planning on doing what I've done in the past during the European tour that I also offer photo shoots mm -hmm. with fans. Um, so that was something I was also looking forward to. That's uh, I do like four cities during a tour where uh, people can book photo shoots with me. Mm -hmm. And besides that, I've had a couple of yeah photo shoots last year um and this year you know you, you just notice a lot of people are scared and if i do their makeup then you're in your face and you officially have to get tests before that and that's just for me takes away the fun and um yeah i have my blog as well and besides that schools are kind of closed <laughs> or uh now they started since this week but only two days every two weeks so that's i'm true. take care of my son a lot mm -hmm. But that takes up a lot of my my time. That is a job in itself, yes. But going back to uh, some happier topics, uh, it's only yes. four more hours until the record is finally released and everybody can enjoy uh, all of the songs on the album. And Omega is also the final part of this metaphysical trilogy that began with the Quantum Enigma. And um, what does the musical future hold for Epica? More music, I hope. <laughs> if we um, if we can tour, I mean, festivals are being postponed once more, which means <laughs> still no shows until December when we are going to uh, Brazil for some shows. Mm -hmm. If we can go there, I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to be realistic in order to not be disappointed. Yeah. But we'll uh, all just continue writing new songs, I guess. Yes. We might have a new album uh, next year already. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, uh, when inspiration strikes, uh, you know. If you have the time I, for it, I'm sure. myself an artist, so I love to create, whether it's music or visual art. Um, yeah, I like to stay busy. And the only problem for me is that my studio is at home and we have a very open space. Mm -hmm. Um home uh, which means if everybody's home i don't have privacy and i like to be isolated when i work on musical ideas mm -hmm. 
so uh, I don't have like a separate room for my music uh, musical adventures okay. so to speak mm-hmm. and for the the acoustic songs for the Omega album I had to do vocal lines and I was singing on on the gallery we have a gallery and guys were sitting in the living room and I had to tell them to be quiet and that's that's not nice yeah so I hope that maybe when the schools get back running then I have a little bit more time to work uh, on that as well I just uh it just came to my mind that you are uh, of the few bands that hasn't tried their luck in live streaming shows Is that something maybe that you would consider for the next year if things uh, keep getting postponed? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it's worth looking into. Um, we just want to play the songs live one way or another. Mm-hmm. And we're going to find a, a solution for that. So, yeah, we we are looking into that, seeing what's possible. The only problem that we have is that we live in four different countries mm-hmm. with four different Corona rules. So um, it's going to be difficult to get the whole band together at the moment. Sure. So we just go with the flow and see what comes our way. <laughs> exactly. That is what the pandemic has taught us all, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. just to see every day how things are developing and to work with that. Yes, yeah. Take it one day at a time. And normally in our uh, industry, we are used to plan one or two years ahead. Mm -hmm. And that is just, uh, yeah, it's difficult. And we just like to plan as much as we can, uh, but also keep in mind that we might have to uh, postpone as well. Yeah. Again, or reschedule. It's a different type of planning, but yeah. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> try to make the best out of it. Oh, yes. And with that, I let you go back to your uh, promotion duties because it is, as we just said, almost time for the very anticipated release. And I thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you as well. And I'm super excited for the release. I hope I can sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I can't wait to hear the responses of our fans. And I hope that the music will also offer some hope, some peace, some tranquility, some, you know, some light in this kind of dark time that we're living in. I'm sure it will. Thank you so much. Thank you too. (laughs) 